tardes, everyone. I'm not going to say any more Spanish, okay? So I'll speak only in English because uh, I'm still learning bit by bit. Um, Scotland, when you think about it, probably the first thing you think about is whiskey. I know you have Old Par whiskey, which is very popular in Colombia, and that's made from Scotland and sent out. But apart from whiskey, uh, we have a number of things that are very popular also in Scotland. One of them is we have one of the best education systems. Um, and what I want to do is talk a little bit about um, the school itself, the university itself, but also the school of management where I actually work and why I think we're actually particularly unique having worked in other universities as well. So just starting with myself, uh, I am half Egyptian, half Scottish, uh, although I grew up mostly in Scotland. Um, all my degrees are from the University of Edinburgh. I studied an undergraduate degree, a master's degree and a PhD there. Um, and my work experience is in telecommunications, advertising and consultancy. And at the moment I teach undergraduate and postgraduate levels as well as PhD students, uh, but mainly international business and international marketing for those. Research interests, bottom of the pyramid ventures, I'm interested in how companies um, can serve or eradicate or reduce poverty while making money at the same time. So not charities, but how to do it actually doing good, but also doing well at the same time. Uh, my other area of expertise, which I use a lot in my teaching, is the internationalization of companies from emerging markets, mainly focusing on Egypt, uh, because I have historical background from there, uh, but shifting also towards Latin American countries also. Touching on the University of St. Andrews itself, okay, so probably some of the greatest facts about it is that it was established in 1413. Um, we are Scotland's first university, okay? So there are a lot of good universities in Scotland, including Edinburgh, University of Glasgow and Strathclyde, but we are the oldest one, we're the, for, known for that. We're also the third oldest in the English-speaking world. Um, in terms of our campus, it's not like Uninorte here, we have a whole campus enclosed. The way it is in St. Andrews is it's part of a town. So the, the buildings, we have old ancient buildings that are there in ruins, uh, next to a golf course and the sea, and in addition to that, we have state-of-the-art new buildings for facilities. But everything is engaged with the town itself. The town is very small. Uh, the nearest city is Edinburgh, which is one hour away. Uh, but I'll give you a glimpse of actually what St. Andrews actually looks like. So if you think of England, you have Oxford and Cambridge. Scotland's are St. Andrews and Edinburgh. We compete head-to-head -head with each other in those ways for ranking positions and everything. But there's some interesting facts between St. Andrews and Edinburgh that distinguish them, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but here, for example, is uh, one of our ancient ruins of a church next to the seaside. Uh, this is one of part of our main square in the university, the registry office. Uh, our graduates, when they graduate, uh, they go for a famous walk along the beach or the shore. Uh, that's because it's in summer and the weather only looks like that in summer, okay? It's actually rainy and other things during the year, but I decided to be a little bit biased and promote it with some nice weather. So this does happen, but only for two months of the year. Um, the management school where I work is right across from the 18th hall. St. Andrews is the birthplace of golf. Uh, and every five years is something called the Open Championship in golf, the biggest tournament in golf, like the World Cup for football. And that takes place at St. Andrews University, and uh, right next to the university in, in the town. And this is the 18th hole, which is the most famous one that golfers, every golfer dreams to play at this actual uh, golf course when they grow up. If we move along to our standards of teaching and research, one of the in most interesting things probably is that every year we always finish in the top three in the UK for student satisfaction. Normally I put top three here to be unbiased, but the last two years we've been number one actually, ahead of in Oxford and Cambridge. The reason why we're able to do it is for two main particular reasons. One is that we use research-led teaching. We don't teach, we do use textbooks because they're important for students, but the people who are writing the textbooks are often the ones who are teaching the actual modules as well, okay? So we have a very strong research-oriented look towards our teaching standards. Small class sizes is one of our best features that we have. Uh, I like to describe St. Andrews as one of the best small universities in Europe or in the world even. Our class sizes are much smaller in comparison to other master's programs and that's very unique because it means that the students and staff have a very strong engagement with each other. Students when they submit essays, you don't just get a grade back but you have the opportunity to sit down with the lecturer and to go through how you can actually improve the actual essay and stuff. So our inter interaction and engagement is very, very, very strong. And of course, that can only be done because of our small class size. So we're selective with our students, but also being smaller means you get more out of your, uh, your education there. Um, 
In terms of research, we are one of Europe's most research-intensive, research if you like, uh, places for learning. We have a lot of good research-led output in many different fields, not just in the management school. Um, and just to show you how strong we are, a lot of our funding or money that comes, we do get some from the Scottish government, but a lot of it actually comes from grants and contracts, actually. So we win a lot of scholarships, or we win a lot of um, grants, if you like, to undertake research, and they're in the millions in some cases as well. Um, ranked first in Scotland, Again, I told you Oxford and Cambridge is St. Andrews and Edinburgh in Scotland. Edinburgh sometimes takes our number one spot, but we try to take it back most years. So we do go head to head. Um, number 14, this is a very interesting ranking. We're number 14 in the UK for something called the REF. The REF is something that comes out in the UK every five years. And what happens is every university has to submit a research portfolio from each staff member within each school. And according to the quality of the research output, you're ranked in terms of a table, okay? You're ranked and they classify you. We finished number 14th in the last ref, which is something we're very proud of because every university before us, the 13th, has 50% more resources than we have, okay? They have 50% more resources. Just to give you an example, Edinburgh, our main competition, uh, our competing university, has uh, 30,000 staff and students together. In St. Andrews, we have 12,000 staff and students together. So we're less than half, but we still manage to compete with uh, these, these old schools, if you like. Uh, quality over quantity, in that case. Academic standards. Um, if you take a look at rankings, you'll find this um, known around the globe. A lot of people refer to us. We have a lot of students from Germany, and particularly the United States of America, coming over. So some of them do choose St. Andrews over their Harvard and Yale to get, to get into our school. Um, we are within the top 1% of universities in the world in terms of the quality of teaching and, and the research output. And interesting, if you take subjects themselves, just the subjects, we actually are ranked usually in the UK's top 10. If not, we're number one. So the latest rankings show that international relations, which is politics, is number one within the UK. Um, Arabic is number one uh, as a subject to learn also in, in, in St. Andrews. And our management school for business or management is number two within the UK. Okay? So we actually came second within the UK for, for management school as well, after Bath University it was. Alumni, successful people who have actually um, graduated from our university. Prince William and Kate both graduated from St. Andrews University. Um, they met at St. Andrews University as well. So that's one of our, if you like, more recent graduates. We also have John Napier over here who invented logarithms within maths. Um, probably one of the interesting links we have with America is I used to wonder why we're such a massive attraction to American students. A lot of Americans come over to study. And one of the reasons is the Prince William aspect, obviously the quality of our teaching, but also John Wilson as well, who is one of the founding fathers who signed the Declaration of Independence for the United States of America. He studied at St. Andrews as well. So these are other ones. Modern day figures. We have Alex Salmond. Alex Salmond is like David Cameron is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. The First Minister of Scotland uh, is Alex Salmond. Now it's Nicola Sturgeon. He only retired last year, but he also graduated from studying international relations um, in, uh, at St. Andrews University. That's the management school. Again, I say small is beautiful. This is right across from the sea and the golf course, okay? So you have the ocean, you have the North Sea and the golf course right there. And this is where I work at. This is my office right here, actually, in that room there, <laughs> just, just to be precise. So it's small, but that's, that's where I work. Um, it has four floors. We have three lecture theaters. Uh, they're small lecture theaters because we have a small number of students. Uh, behind us is medicine and physics and other universities, and we borrow from their um, uh, facilities sometimes. They have a huge lecture theatre, so we borrow that for our first and second year undergraduate students, which is the big intake, obviously. Uh, but our master's students are all taught within, actually, here. Okay, so School of Management. One thing that's important that distinguishes us is that we're a school of management. We are not a business school, okay? A lot of uh, universities in the UK are business schools or have choose, chosen to move from management to business. Why is that important for us? It allows us to actually offer unique courses to students. We believe that when it comes to management or when it comes to actually running a business, it doesn't have to be the private sector only. It can be non-government organizations and it can be the public sector. All of them need to be managed. All of them need to be run. So we prefer to call ourselves a management school which offers courses in all three areas. So prepare, some students don't want to work for McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group when they finish, but they want to work for a charity or they want to work for the public sector. So we believe in actually teaching actually the strategies or giving you the tools to succeed in all those particular areas. 
One of my favorite points about the university, why I'm passionate about it, is number two, flat organizational structure. Because we are small, all our staff members are treated equally. We help each other out. Um, we, have, we have a strong bond with each other, if you like, in that way. Um, the relationships are great. So as I said, if you want help or second marking, we always have that available. So people are always willing to help out with each other. That creates an organizational culture where we're like a family business. We feel small, we feel like a family business. Everyone helps each other in that way. Unlike other universities which are higher and all they care about is being a factory where they intake students and they can get as many of them out as possible and make as much money as possible from there. Money is important to sustain us as a, as a university, but we still believe in the quality of teaching and that gets balanced in that way. We get a lot of applications because of our reputation, which was not based on output uh, of, of number of students, but based on the values that we actually have that's strong together. A number of years ago, we decided to have a key theme for our school. The key theme for our school became responsible enterprise. Um, we noticed in St. Andrews that um, a, lo a, lot of, a lot of research or a lot of companies were trying to deal with something called responsible enterprise. Um, CSR, doing good, uh, clean energy, things like that. So that became the core theme of our school. So every course that we offer has at least one lecture to do with the CSR element. So if you teach marketing, it's marketing and CSR. If it's international business, international business and responsible enterprise as well. That's our, that's our core theme. And the number of researchers we have in there are leaders actually in producing the output for uh, this particular topic. So it's a main attraction, particularly in Europe, this going green, clean energy, responsible enterprise, and we are at the forefront of actually doing so. And we have a center for that research as well. Okay, teaching unique courses. Um, obviously, we offer your standard strategy, international business courses that other universities do, but we also offer um, courses that are not available anywhere else. I'll show you an example of one or two of them uh, as we go on. Um, but like I said, they are unique on, on both programs, undergraduate and the postgraduate one. Close interactions between lecturers and teaching fellows. Okay, so at universities, you often have lecturers who become senior lecturers, who become professors. At St. Andrews, we've actually created something which is different to other universities. There's two tracks. You can be a lecturer, senior lecturer, professor, or you can be a teaching fellow, a senior teaching fellow, and a principal teaching fellow. This allows us to have a better balance between giving students more time in terms of quality of teaching and allows us to focus on doing well with our research output as well. So we have two career paths, actually, for, for, for people in that way. Capstone module, not a lot of universities do this as well, but in fourth year undergraduate, you take a core course, which is a capstone module you have to take, and it's taught by 10 different lecturers within the university. Each one is a specialist in one area. Each one delivers a lecture on that particular course. Other universities have team taught courses, maybe one or two, uh, lecture, two, two or three lectures teaching together. This one actually involves the whole staff or the whole school together, bringing the expertise into, into one module. That's core. Our taught master programs, the way it works for a master's, if you go to the US, it takes two years. In the UK, it's one year to get your master's. You start in September, and you finish at the end of August. Uh, and I'll show you the, the structure of how it works. These are the master's programs we offer. They are limited, but they are special and, and, and quality driven. I teach particularly on the MLIT international business and the management courses that are available there. Here's an example of a program structure. Uh, so if you were to study uh, an MLIT in international business, you would have core modules that you have to take, um, including the global issues in management and contemporary conceptual issues in management. These are practical and they are also very theoretical as well, so practical and theoretical, and they're core modules you must take. Also, we have in the first semester something called global business strategy. This is also a theoretical point, keeping you up to date with all the issues from the start to up to date with international business that goes on. In the second semester, which is the master classes, this involves us bringing guest speakers from industry. So we bring people from, say, McKinsey, HSBC, or people to actually talk uh, or give a talk to you in, in, in the weeks to come. So there's usually about six or seven that are arranged. Um, and it allows a chance for the students to understand the syllabus they're being taught in theory and relate it to practice and to ask questions. We can also have debates between the people that work in the industry of what theory seems useful and what is actually not useful as well. So it's our perfect way of balancing theory and actually practice as well to equip you for, for the real world. In terms of courses that are optional, you also can take one in the first semester, one in the second semester. And here's a list of ones that we have. Our entrepreneurship course is actually taught by somebody who was an entrepreneur for 20 years. 
and is now basically um, older, retired from, from business, and he teaches at school. So he's actually first-hand experienced business. It's a very challenging course. Um, I teach on the international marketing one, but for example, we have managing natural resources very contemporary for businesses right now, and also the non-government organizations courses. These are courses that are very unique, developed within our school, and we feel it actually offers it more of a management perspective rather than just a, a business school. Moving away from the taught master's programs, we also offer obviously a PhD. Uh, this is like also a small community we have. Um, there is something called a master's in research called an MRES, which we do. This is one year of learning about core research skills and contemporary management issues to be able to find the topic that you want to investigate clearly and to be able to learn the skills of how to undertake them in quantitative manners and in qualitative manners as well. Um, it's, it's a recognized course by the ESRC. This is one of the most important bodies within Scotland uh, that gives funding out for a particular degree. So if it's recognized by them, it's basically uh, at the right standard. Um, there's something called a 1 plus 3, so a PhD normally takes three years, but a 1 plus 3 means doing the MRES first and then moving on to the PhD program, where you'll work with two uh, professors who are specialized in the area in which you're working on, uh, and then you obviously will have to write basically 80,000 words minimum of a, of a book on a topic uh, and get examined basically orally on it. But those are the other research aspects, if you like, we have, as opposed to the, the, the taught ones. In terms of um, scholarships, um, when I was at Edinburgh, I, there was a number of colleagues of mine who were from Colombia uh, who were studying with me at the, the PhD. And uh, the thing to be aware of is to try and look for the scholarships that are available to you. There's probably more than you actually think. If you go to our university's website uh, or anyone within the UK, we have scholarships like the Dean's Scholarship, the School Scholarship, things like that available. So these are things worth checking all the time when the scholarships are available and if you uh, applies to you to actually get one. So do bear that in mind. Also bear also in mind here in, uh, in, in, in Colombia, you have Colcensius as well, which is like a national scholarship you can win. And that's been heavily funded recently for master's programs, especially to, to go and study that abroad. So do, don't think, oh, there's no scholarship for me. Do try and look around uh, internationally within the university you're trying to, to go to plus actually at home as well, what is actually available to you. So do think of the scholarship options uh, that might be available. Um, one of the other points is what you expect and what we expect is something similar. We try to align this. One is when you come and study, it will be a challenge. Um, especially when you, when you come from another country, you're obviously dealing a little bit with the language issues and things like that, but we set our courses to be challenging. We push you the extra mile. Things are not going to be learned from a book and go and repeat it. It's going to be actually engaging you a lot with material that is difficult to, to understand. Creativity, we hope during the process of when you study with us, you become more creative. There was a um, survey recently developed in the UK asking managers what was the most important thing they wanted from graduates when they finished their actual degree. And the most important thing cited by the managers was the critical thinking. They don't care so much about the content you learn to apply straight away because they will train you when you go to work for a company. What they care about is can you be critical thinking. What we do in our courses is we give you models that are established and we expect you to be able to criticize it, find faults with them, improve it, join it with another theory, explain where its limitations are and where its pros are. Every theory has a problem. No theory is perfect. We challenge you so that when you approach any problem, you think outside the box and try to analyze it from that particular perspective. Only the people that are good at doing that are PhDs when they finish because they spent such a long time doing that. But in our master's programs, we develop it based on that. That is our core foundation, to make you critically think about issues. How can something be better? How can it improve? A chance to explore, obviously, your own interests by taking the courses that you want. And of course, we expect you to work within groups individually. When you work in groups in our school, because our master's programs have a lot of international students, we do our best to make a group exercise. Uh, usually, it's about four people in one group. And we try to put different nationalities and genders together. So you may have a Colombian with a, an American, uh, with a French, and with a Chinese student all together. And that's part of you dealing and managing the different cultural aspects that will happen when you, when you go to work as well. So we on purposely try to diversify uh, those particular groups. <coughs> Student experience is obviously one of the key things, like I said, it's one of our foundations uh, of our university that we focus on. Our, our slogan for the university is ever to excel. This is something that the staff know and the students get to know. 
For staff, effort to excel means, can I do better? Can I push myself further? Can I challenge the students a bit more? Can I do something innovative in my class? From a student's perspective, it's the idea of if you don't get the grade you want, you'll get it the next time. Push yourself further. You can do better. You will do, you will do good. All that comes, obviously, from the idea of delivering world-class teaching and research output, which are both fed into each other. We have good output in research, and that feeds into our teaching again, to give you the latest um, teaching that's available or material that's actually available. Strong focus, again, like I said, on reflective learning and critical thinking. Again, this being one of the key things, I think, that's at the heart of our school. Uh, a master's program is only a master's program if you can master your critical thinking level. Finally, um, like I said, we try to bridge this gap between theory and practice. We teach you theory that exists, but we ask you to challenge it in the actual real world. Can you explain the theory? Can you find its limitations? And can you explain it practically, show examples of how that doesn't work as well? And this is actually cut by teaching theory and bringing in guest speakers from industry. That's how we bridge the gap between the two of them that are actually available in that way. Finally, that's, uh, that's everything about it. This is the website, so for St. Andrews, please take it down if you want, is just up until ac.uk, that's the university, forward slash will take you to the management school itself. So obviously we have international relations, history, medicine, uh, and other topics as well like that. But that's the actual thing. I also have a few business cards with me at the end if you want to take one from me. But also my profile is on the, on the website as well. If you go to management school and you go to staff, you'll see my profile there as well. Uh, but that's basically it. Um, Everything was true except for the weather uh, that I didn't talk about. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me about um, the university, the school, or living in Scotland or studying in Scotland. Ask me anything. I didn't hear, I didn't hear, I didn't hear. I didn't hear. If I want to go there, I need money first. So, how much do I have to pay, for example? Okay, uh, it all depends, and these things change over time, okay? But our master's program uh, for international students it comes roughly between 18 to 20,000 pounds. So one may need a scholarship, obviously, for, for that. Living expenses, uh, expenses, the UK is quite expensive. Uh, St. Andrews is quite expensive, so is Edinburgh. Um, so it really depends, but you have, to look at, um, you have to look at things online to look at how much costs, or speak to previous people who have been there, to find out the cost that's available, and try and work out how much scholarship will budget you for, because you may be able to get a scholarship that will pay the fees for the course and give you a certain amount of budget that you can live within as well, you know? But it really depends, because you can get cheaper rates by living slightly outside and traveling by bus to the university than staying in the, in the center of the actual city. Yeah? It's a good question, actually. I haven't thought to delve that far into it. Um, but basically, we do have something called St. Andrew's Day, um, which, if, if I'm not mistaken, a long time ago, uh, St. Andrew's Day in Scotland coincided with the graduation day of the universities when students would first start. So there's a link between St. Andrew's the Saint and actually the, the school's name linked to that in that, in that particular sense. Is this a Catholic school? Sorry? No, it's, it's, not, it's not religious based at all. I mean, it f founded from uh, Protestants, actually, Protestantism, which is, I think here you call Christian um, side, but they've, a lot of universities have moved away from that. It's just, a, it's, it's because it's in 1413, so old, it has that establishment. The buildings as well look like churches, some of them almost, but again, it's just because of the, the date, if you like, of that. But St. Andrews is the capital of an area in Scotland called Fife. Fife is a region of collection of villages together, and St Andrews is the capital of, of, of that region. But it's still very small. Um, there's three main streets only in the actual place. Uh, one is called Market Street, North Street, and South Street. Those are the main streets uh, that we actually have. Uh, so it's very it's a town basically, you know. And that's why, again, while we're a small university, trying to expand in that way. Okay. So we have an option, I don't know, in the other four years that we can have a double titulation program, that we have a diploma here and a diploma in the... So I want
As, it's a very good question, actually. It's something that we are still trying to forge. Uh, the moment what we've done in St. Andrews in the university, um, not just the management school, uh, we work closely with economics and international relations. So the three of us are, are one sort of set together. Um, but what we, what we do um, is uh, we've signed agreements for our undergraduates, particularly to go abroad, to, with Australian universities and American universities. Those are the only two strong links that we have, right? What we're trying to do is we're, we're exploring options within Asia and Latin America to look at maybe forming these idea of double degrees where maybe you spend a bit of time over there or you get something that's recognized by, by that. Other. So we are a little bit... Um, we, we were too close at one stage. I think we only wanted to work with US and Australia, but now we're expanding our horizons. That's something we're still developing. So that option is not available, but it is something to look out for that we may, may be developing in that way. So well. if I went to go there right now, uh, would you be doing an exchange and not a double Even the exchange would be... Uh, we do have exchanges, yes. You'd have to, you'd have to work at it. For example, last year I taught... Um, a fourth year course on strategic management and we had I had one student from Uruguay and one student from Argentina who were on the course and they were doing they were spending I think either one semester or one whole year basically in, in the school there uh, but it was very much worked from her university finding links with our university that particular way okay so you'd have to use your institution Bridget for for our institution as well but if you again uh, if you look for university, send me an email or something about that. We can also discuss that for like a look at the options that, that are available for that as well. But at the moment, like I said, our double degree agreements are only with Australia and American universities at the moment. But we're looking to expand that. Or you're not studying management as your undergraduate degree. That's okay. Um, we have two, two of our master's programs. There was international business and there was management. This is not a, it's not a rule, but generally speaking, um, the students that we accept for the international business one are students that have management experience or have studied management before. So it's taking it another level. But the MLIT in management is for students who have studied anything before in their undergraduate. So you may have studied geography, history, uh, science, engineering, and that's designed more for students who want to you know, have a degree, but then will do a master's to specialize in management. So the option is available for both of those. But that's not the rule of thumb, but generally our international business is mainly for advancing knowledge, and management is for providing for those who have done other degrees. Sorry, say again? Yeah. That she doesn't study management or business. In the undergraduate degree. Yeah. But that's fine. You can still do a master's in management. No, she yeah. doesn't study management she or business. About, she wants to know about the other careers. Oh, the, the, other, the other, okay, the others. Um, okay. There, again, I would say to you have to go to the website mainly to look at the, the other options because um, I work within the management school. Uh, you'd have to look at the, the, the other ones that are available, like international relations, economics. You'd have to look at uh, other schools that are available because obviously this is a school that I, I work within, so I know within the management context there as well. But the, there's, there's other schools. There's medicine, history, anything you can think of, except engineering. We don't have engineering school, but there are other ones available as well. But obviously I can only promote... I mean, if I was promoting international relations, I, I'd be lying because I'm not, I don't work there. I only know what I actually engage with in that way. Living expenses. Again, it varies from, from, from thing to thing. So if you live within uh, the center of St. Andrews, it's more expensive than living slightly further out in one of the towns and commuting. Uh, the rates also change, but I would say probably it's needed about, I and mean, this is just off the top of my head, I would say probably about 800 pounds to 1,000 per month. For example, I went earlier to a conference about 
buddies in France. Yes. And they told us that the government helped them with some part of their fees, but I don't know if that's the case in uh, in Scotland, no. In Scotland, what we have is the, the local students, like the undergraduate degree is free for the, under, for the Scottish students. Um, and obviously, the fees we have here is different for international students and EU students. So EU students have a fee and international students have a fee. So I was saying 19,000 roughly for a master's program. For the EU student, it's something like, I think, 11, 10, something like that. So it's about that. But um, France is quite generous in that way of, of, of offering those things. Um, but again, you can get a scholarship, like I said, that will account for the expenses of the fees, plus that if you look around. Uh, actually, it's probably a good idea at this point to uh, bring Sarah, uh, Professor Lopez, uh, in, into this, because she actually studied in, in Edinburgh for four years uh, over there, and she had a scholarship. So she's a Colombian with first-hand experience. I, I got a scholarship from Presciencias. Presciencias is giving out a lot of scholarships to students. Mm -hmm. So I would like to Scotland. There's always more available than you think. But it's a good point about working. You can work there a number of hours as well uh, while you're in the UK. Um, whether it be with the university or working in a store, coffee shop or something else, you can do that as well to earn more money to, 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 fund, to fund the way as well. Yeah, um, so how about the language? The one who goes from here to there without the language? It's a good... Uh, I mean, a lot of our students... I mean, there has to be... A, a, a basic level of English, uh, in, I mean, a good standard of English, let's say. It's very hard for me to give you a, a point of how good, because there's different levels. But yeah, we do have a lot of master's students who come and not so confident in the language, but quite good. And then they improve as they go on, because they're speaking to other students all the time, interacting every day um, in that way. There's also in the universities uh, something called K-Pods we have. Uh, and this is an institution, uh, part of the university within it, and they have extra language courses in English, uh, writing, to improve their skills for international students um, in general. So those services are, are free to access in the university as long as you're a student there. So you can always take extra classes in English and, and, and things like that as well. So that's available. But generally speaking, you have to be confident, standard, and it will improve over time. So I have seen, yes, people are not 100% fluent in that way.
Yeah, there, there might be a score. They might ask you as a student to come um, to do a test, basically, in English, and to achieve a certain score. Uh, it'll be lower for the masters than the PhD, obviously, uh, because English doesn't have to be like the PhD. But if you, you can do practice those tests and you can take those tests. And in some cases, there'll, there'll be that as well in place. Sorry, one over here because he was waiting for a while. I don't know about it because our scholarships change from year to year and what's available. Uh, obviously, I've stopped studying, so I don't know for scholarships anymore in that way. But that's an example of what I was saying. Keep checking the website, and they change. The dean's scholarship, the head of school scholarship. It depends also on our income that year. The money that we have left over in our fund as a school, we will give amount of scholarships out that way as well. So it can be three one year, one one year, five another year. It can be focused on a particular region one year. These things change. So that's why you have to keep up to date by looking at the, the actual scholarship uh, scholarships that are available. That one, for example, I'm not aware of that one. Uh, but again, they change from time to time. They increase and decrease in terms of numbers. Yeah. Correct. I want to know because, you know, older universities in the United States, it's very difficult to get in, into a master. It's very difficult. It's like, like you know, everyone goes to go the faster they, they want to. They reject them a lot. So I don't know how it's done in the UK. It's a good question. We have two members of staff who look for the profiles of students. Uh, to, 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 to choose, uh, to be selective. We are the best in Scotland. We are a very good reputation. So obviously we demand, we look for high students. You have to be the best at where you've, got. but I mean, we're not gonna be biased. We like to have also a, a, like a multicultural uh, people in our class. So if, for example, 100 Americans look all great and perform, we're not gonna take 100 Americans because we want Americans, French, Germans, different nationalities available to work together. So coming from Latin America, everything will look, look, be looked within context. If you, if you scored very highly in your undergraduate degree within the institution you were in, in Latin America and Colombia, uh, and you have the next activities and your profile looks good, you would be accepted. So it's very hard for me to say to you there's a criteria A, B, C, and D. Um, you have to be academically strong, have the extra activities, and look on your CV like you are somebody who has potential. So recruitment is always not based on the four-star student, but it's also based on what you can show in the CV that shows potential, that you can actually learn and do well as well that way. To apply for a master, do you need to write an essay? Uh, no, you don't have to write an essay, no. It's a, it's a form you fill in. Uh, there'll be a form online. And again, it might ask you for the English test, uh, etc. Like but again, every program, I work within the International Business Program, but each one, depending on the course director, will have their own requisites that year for, for, for that way. But usually you apply with a, with a form, and it includes things that you'd have on your CV to put in, in, in place there, and we'll judge it that way. And again, like I said, we're small, so we take a small number of students. 70 is a maximum on our master's program. Yeah. But what do you need? Like, you need to go to, I don't know, do charity, or you need to write essays, or you need to be... No. The, the, the best thing to do is to link your application to the school itself. If you want to apply for a particular master's program here, study the master's program course structure on the website and try to see why you're a good fit for that particular school. For example, you may say that you want to, you're particularly interested not necessarily working in the private sector, but you want to work in the public sector or for non-government organizations. That we would see as a key link to what we offer in our particular school. So try to match your profile to what we offer as an actual school, what we promote as an actual school, as our theme. Okay, like finding activities related to the master's. To, to, to the master's, well, show what it is you study, what you've learned, why you want to advance it, why do you want to come study here, what do you think this is going to offer you, what is it you want to do with your career. Try to show us that matching, that, that ambition of what you want to do and, and your, 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 your option of what you want to do so we can see the matching uh, with that particular profile. But obviously one of the core points is you have to
school. <laughs> you have to do really well at school. I mean, that's going to be the starting point. You have to do well uh, for us to believe that you can actually have the capacity to complete the masters in our university as well. But the other thing is, study the website. Study, study what we offer, what our school does, and how you think you'd be good, why you should be accepted, why you should fit in that particular school. Yeah. But if I wanted to make a third option, do I have to pay more or is there still possibilities to do that? Trust me, once you do the option in that one, there'll be a lot of work, right? You will not want to take a third one. You know? At the beginning, you'll sit and say, oh, I want to do this one, this one, this one. Because then we start doing the work a lot. They are, um, I mean, in some cases, uh, you may be allowed to sit in on a couple of the other classes. So you don't take the course, but you sit in the class and, and look at a couple of the lectures. You, we can allow that to happen. Um, but generally, trust me, I know this. I, I did a master's myself, and I wanted to do all of them. And then once I picked them, I was like, oh, I wish there was less to actually do. You know? But the core ones are the ones we want you to, to leave. You have to leave with those core ones, because those are the ones we believe are important for industry, for working, for taking your career forward. The other ones are for you to explore. So. The popular ones are entrepreneurship, of course, that one, and the other one being one of my courses, international marketing, uh, or towards, obviously, the, the, the new ones, like the natural resources management, or the NGOs, for example, you know, something a bit different. Uh, but trust me, that will cover a lot. Uh, and in, in, that, in the international business one, uh, there was global conceptual issues and global contemporary issues in management, and that covers a lot of different things within management as well. So it could be ethics uh, issues. So there'll be a lot of topics coming uh, w within that area as well. Yeah? No problem. Okay, so thank you guys.